This is Pawn Zero to Hero. It's the second episode and today we're going to be reversing some assembly. In the last episode, we looked at the basics of assembly. We covered the stack, registers, and some of the most common instructions. If you haven't already, check this video and the full playlist out as we will be directly building upon that. Links are in the description down below. Now today, we are gonna put those newly acquired skills to the test. Because we will be looking at some assembly code and we will try to figure out what in the world it does. It's going to be a fun one for sure, but before we get into that, I would like to make some remarks on comments on the last video. First of all, Yishan commented that operations like move do a copy and not a move. And that can trip up some beginners indeed. Uh, and that is true. So after the move operation, both of the registers in this case will be containing the value. Uh, and that's something to keep in the back of your head. However, this is not something you usually need to be worried about. Secondly, Eunice Aiden pointed out a very silly mistake I made that you can hear now. Their size has been pretty fixed at 64 bits or two bytes. So a word is two bytes. Now, obviously, two bytes is not 64 bits, but 16 bits. So my apologies for that silly mistake. But with all of that cleared up, we can go and reverse our first binary. Hello? We have this binary here and we don't know what it does. Now, instead of running it to find out, we're going to take a look at the assembly code to see if we can determine what this binary does. But first, let's run file on this binary to see what we're dealing with. And we see that this is a 32-bit elf binary. Good to keep in mind. We can now look at the assembly code using object dump as such, which we pipe to less, and then we can search for main, because that is our main function. And this is the result. Our assembly code, but this is a mess. How do we even begin to make sense out of it? Well, I'm going to help you with that, because I'm going to split it up into three parts, as you can see right here. Now, this first part is pretty much just the initialization that has to be done in order to get the function going. And the last part is just how we exit a function and that really only leaves us with these two instructions. And don't worry, I will cover everything that we've just left out at the end of the video, but for now, we can just forget about it. The remaining two instructions are a push of a value and a call. This call instruction is going to call puts. Now puts takes in one argument, a pointer, and it outputs where it points to, to the screen. So from that, we know that we're going to print something here. But what? What are we going to print? Well, put stakes in an argument. But do you remember from the last video where it takes that argument from? Let's do a little quiz here and I'll give you four options and five seconds to pick the right one. Time's up. If you answered the RDI register, then you are wrong. However, you are kind of close because the RDI register is indeed used for the first argument, but in 64-bit binaries. This binary is 32-bit, and in that case, we take our arguments from the stack. So good on you if you caught that. If not, then do not worry because it's only an opportunity to learn. So puts is going to print something from a pointer on the stack, and we see that right before the call, we push something onto the stack. So that's what this binary is going to do. Print the thing that 80484BO is pointing towards. But what is that pointing to? And for that, we're going to look in a different data section of our binary, the read-only data. If you want to learn way more on the internals of a binary, then check out the talk I did where we took a deep dive into elf binaries. However, for this example, we can just look at the data. So I'm going to use object dump and that way we can dump the read-only data and at the location found in the assembly, we find the string hello world. So any last guesses as to what this binary will do? Well, let's run it to find out. And if we do, we see that indeed this binary prints out hello world. 
Now, was this too easy for you? Then let's level it up because I have another binary lined up just for you. Moving on to our next binary, which is another 32-bit elf binary. Now I've pulled out the assembly code using object dump again, and this is it. Just like before, we can split this up and only concern ourselves with the assembly code that is actually important to us, which is all of this. We start off by moving the value OXA or 10 to somewhere onto the stack. Immediately preceding that, we perform a compare instruction where we compare the same place on the stack as before with the value 10. Now these are always going to be equal since we've just put the value there. Now we reach a jump if not equal instruction and it wants to jump to somewhere here. However, it's not going to jump because in our compare just above the two operands were equal. And this instruction only makes the jump if they aren't equal. So we don't jump and we just move along to this subtract instruction, which will just make some space on the stack. So we don't need to worry about that. But then we see something that you should recognize from our last binary, a call to puts. We're printing out a value again. And by looking in the read only data section of the elf binary, we find that it will print out x equals 10. And that's it for this binary. That's all. It checks if a value is 10, and if it is, it will print that out. Notice how we are getting faster at going through this assembly. That's what happens if you look at more of it. But this binary was a great example of what an if statement would look like in assembly. But that's not all I want to show you today, because this video has been building up to this next binary. Our third and last binary here is another 32-bit elf binary. As with the previous two examples that I showed here, I used object dump to get the assembly out of there and this is the result. Now we're moving the setup and the breakdown of the function and this is the assembly that we have to reverse. We start off by moving zero onto the stack and let's mentally rename this location to variable x just to make it easier for us. We then perform a jump to 804842c, which is all the way down here. Now we perform that instruction, which is a compare. We compare our variable x with ox13, which is 19 in decimal, and our variable currently holds 0, so these two are not equal. 0 is less than 19. Following that, we have an instruction that we haven't seen yet the JLE or the jump if less or equal instruction, which, well, it will make the jump if it's less than or equal. And in this case, zero is less than 19. Thus, we are going to make this jump. We end up here and continue by making some space onto the stack, following, uh, followed by pushing our variable X onto the stack and pushing this value on the stack. And why do we push this value on the stack? Well, that's because now we are going to call printf. Printf is very similar to puts, so it will output something onto the screen. However, it allows the use of format strings. In that case, our first argument would be a pointer to a string, which contains some format specifiers. And let's see if that's true uh, for our first argument, which is the last thing that we pushed onto the stack. So OX80484CO. And by looking at the read only data of our binary, we can see that at that location, we find a percentage D, which is the format specifier for outputting a decimal integer. The other arguments passed into printf will then be used to fill those identifiers. So in this case, we will replace percentage D with our variable X and print that out. Thus, in this case, printing out a zero. But we're not yet done because moving down, we see that an add instruction is being run and this add instruction adds one to our variable X. Now we run into the same compare instruction that we saw before. So we check if X is smaller or equal than 19, which it is because it's one. So we jump all the way back up and now we are uh, again going to push our variable x onto the stack. We're going to push a pointer to that same format string containing percentage d. 
and calling printf. This time we're printing out a one. And now the cycle repeats. We add one to x, it's less than 19, so we print it out again, add one again, print it out, and so on. Uh, printing out zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and so on. But after a while, x becomes 19. So we print out 19, and now we add one to x. x is 20 now. We reach the compare statement, and x is now not smaller than or equal to 19. Thus, we do not make this jump back up, and we exit the loop. And let's look at our program running in action, and as expected, it prints out 0 through 19. Now this was an example of what a simple for loop would look like in assembly. As you can see, this can be done in a very limited amount of instructions, and once you see the pattern in there, it's really easy to figure out what it's doing. On the screen right now, you can also see what the source code of this binary would look like. But those are the three binaries that I wanted to discuss with you today. Now, if you've never seen assembly before, then this may have been a bit of a headache to look through. So if you want to read up on this again, then check out the page in the Nightmare course. And if you want to examine these examples for your own, then visit this GitHub repository by Kabla for the samples uh, for these binaries. But for now, there is one last thing that I'd love to discuss with you, and that's the beginning and ending of a function in assembly. I would love to dig in a bit deeper in that little piece of assembly that we always just cut off. This is what we always cut out of our assembly. Since this part of the video is not too important, it will have some less editing and all around be a bit more rough, so feel free to skip over this part uh, but we're going to start at the beginning of this assembly now. And we begin with the load effective address instruction, which is just going to save the original stack pointer. We want to do this since after this function concludes, we want to restore the RSP to its original value. Next up, we perform an AND operation. And if you have some knowledge of bitwise operations, you may know that after this operation, the last byte of RSP will be zero. However, all the other bits will remain the exact same. But why do we do this odd instruction? Well, this is called a stack alignment. The compiler wants to align the stack pointer on a 16 byte boundary before it pushes anything to the stack. And this is done for various reasons because certain instructions as memory, access needs it to be aligned, but, but we don't need to worry about all that. We just need to know that this is a stack alignment. Moving on, we're going to store the return address by pushing it onto the stack. This way, when we want to exit out of the function using a return, it can pop the value and jump to there. The instruction following that will store the previous base pointer again, so when we exit out of the function, the parent function still knows its base pointer. The move instruction that follows will then create a new stack frame by setting the base of the stack to the stack pointer, making them both equal. And here we notice that the move instruction is indeed doing a copy and not a move because the value is not being removed from the ESP. Lastly, we need to save the original ESP that we created in the beginning by pushing that onto the stack. Now the function can do its thing. It can modify registers, push and pop from the stack, and then we will reach the end of the function where we will pretty much do the opposite of what happened in the beginning. We will take all the stored values from the stack and reinstantiate the right stack pointer and so on. Uh, the return statement will then grab the place it needs to jump to from the stack and jump there back into the parent function. Note that you may find even more ghost instructions following the return instruction, but these are not executed, so you don't need to worry about them. And believe it or not, that's all. That's how Simple it is to set up a function in assembly. There are some odd concepts here that still often raise my eyebrows, but the most important part is recognizing that this is in fact the setup of a function and not wasting time trying to figure out what it does. To end this video off, let's do a quick recap on what we learned as well as what we are going to cover in the next one. Today we applied our theoretical knowledge that we gained in the last video on some small binaries. We took a deep dive into their assembly and noticed that we were able to reverse them and figure out what the binary does without even running it. 
In real life, we will often come across a lot of binaries. However, they will always be incredibly more difficult and complex than this. But being able to identify some building blocks such as for loops or an if statement can greatly help in understanding larger binaries. But everything that we are currently doing manually can also partly be automated. So in the next video, we will dive deep into Ghidra, an amazing tool that will save you heaps or stacks of time. And that was it for the second episode of this series. I've been very happy with the support I've received on the first one and seeing the videos get a nice amount of views, comments and likes really, really motivates me to make more. So if you enjoyed this video, I would like to ask you to click that like button. And if you have any friends that really, really need to get into the world of binary exploitation, then please do share these videos with them. But that's it for me. I hope you enjoyed the video and I hope to see you back next week.